I'm going to go back uh, in history a little bit for myself. We're going to talk about uh, two old pieces. One is from 1998, it was the first premiere of the Amazale Voices. And the other one is from 2004, which was the, the, the year of the Cracks and Corrosion number two was uh, premiered. And uh, the Amazale Voices was my first experience with a kind of true live electronic piece. I uh, had done a few pieces with tape and uh, performance before. And uh, I was just about to go down to Air Camp, France, and uh, they, they were known, and still known for their research in score following techniques, which I didn't know much about more than what I heard rumors about, so I thought I should, I'm going to try this out and see what it's about. That was kind of my attitude going there. So, um, it's all about the problem of synchronization, because if you have a tape and you ask a performer to play along, of course it's kind of a stressful situation, because you know that the tape won't follow you, you have to follow the tape. So if you kind of mess up, then there's no way the tape will save you. Whereas you cannot just have to trust your abilities. And there are a lot of good pieces done this way. It's not a bad technique, it just works, so to speak. But it gives a kind of, uh, it's not very interactive, let's put it that way. The, and one solution is to create a clip track, but the playing with a metronome in your ear is not very attractive either. I did it a few times, and I done, used conductors with clip track to kind of bypass the problem that the performers would have the, the, the conductor would be the one suffering, so to speak. Uh, but still, uh, now I saw the possibility to try this out and replace, um, first of all, of course, replace a tape recorder, a uh, tape machine with a computer. I might have done that already, but this computer could do any type of sound now. And to replace the click track by a microphone, and I gave the whole, the whole problem is kind of move to the computer side. That's up to the computer to follow the performer. So I had no idea if this would be possible. So I came up with this uh, image of this being possible and see what was what, what they could help them with, so to speak. And um, so I went into what's called score following, which is uh, the idea is that you have a, a score in the computer and uh, uh, with all the events, and the computer is trying to follow what the performer does compared with the score and try to react to it some, somehow. And it kind of encouraged you to, to compose in a, what I would call an event-driven with an event driven approach. That you search for something in the score, and when you find it, you react. Well, that's an event. So you kind of create these events. You hear something, and then you make an output according to that. So I think that approach also affected my way of structuring the piece. This is the old piece. This is the form of the piece. And I was interested also in one thing, which actually took me, with me back to Sweden from the first time I was in Canada as a student at McGill University back in 94, and studied the time approaches to music uh, with Professor Brian Chern that, that was his big, I think still is his big topic. Uh, and I wanted to have, have a piece that had a very large scale process in time. So it's a very simple process. If you see the lines here, they get closer together up to one minute and then they go more and more far apart with the exception of a minute section, which is something else. So it's kind of a huge, large <coughs> redundant, which is kind of hard to compose and keep in control of 10 minutes and still have the flow of that. So that was one thing that interested me. And all these uh, vertical lines, though, those became my like, events in the music. I'm going to condense my description of the piece a little bit to be able to play a little bit of it. Uh, this is just the structure of the score follower. So you have uh, you have to detect what's coming into the microphone. That's what you have to program the computer to do. Uh, then you have a score that's stored in the computer somehow. And then you compare this score, what is expected to happen, with what actually happens. And then depending on that comparison between the two, you trigger an output somehow. That's the score forward. So it's fantastic if it works. Mm -hmm. One of the experiences I got, of course, is that it doesn't always work, because it's very hard. It's extremely hard to make it work. But it is possible, and there are some really nice examples of pieces where it kind of works, I would say. So this is my piece. Uh, it's for cello and live electronics. Cello is a bad choice if you're going to do, do score following because it's very hard to detect. They can do all type of in-between pitches and they will really have an idea what to do. It's low frequency uh, register which is harder to detect. Flute is much easier to follow than a cello because the lower you get into uh, analyzing the lower pitches, you get into the harder it is to be fast to analyze pitch. You need some time for the computer to figure out what it is. So you have the cello part, you have the live electronic part, which is just sketched there, and then you have the events. One, two, 
three, four, five, and continues. So one of the first thing I, I um, figured out that let's forget about pitch altogether because it's just a mess. If you want something happen fast, it's so insecure, so I wouldn't even care about it. So I was going for amplitude. So the only thing I actually detect here is rests. There are rests. If it, the job is playing or if it's not playing. It's playing loud all the time. And if the rest comes, then that's a clear indication where you are. So, to speak. so there are some risks. What about if the cellist tends to play not so legato? Well, that's one thing he's not allowed to do. The other thing is the cello has a, cello has a big uh, resonance. So if the rest is short, the resonance will kind of hang over the, the brakes. So that's another thing I kind of try to solve with filters and encourage a certain performance technique also. So all these things, I, I, I really work close with the cellist. I will work pretty hard on this, actually. We spent a couple of months on this problem. And the final, we came up with something that work was performed. Uh, I didn't have to interact at all with the, at the, the premiere of the piece. It's kind of a nice uh, approach. Just look at the computer, it's doing work for you. It's a very tense approach because you know that I, you, I never trusted that computer. <laughs> he was doing it, but but uh, I knew that it was kind of never far from kind of collapsing. So you were that kind of thing. first aid guy behind the screen, so to speak, if something happened. But it worked. It worked a couple of concerts like this, and then it changed for a more secure version. So when he's finding these rests, he is uh, triggering these outputs. These are you know, loud chords, uh, and they're very loud. They're not at all discreet. They are extremely bit, uh, uh, audible. So if it's wrong, you would really hear it. There's no kind of hiding errors there, right in the face. So that's uh, uh, one character of the music. The other thing, which I didn't really need the uh, score followers so desperately for, is to uh, make the connection between what's happening here in the live electronics and this pitch. That's a G sharp, and that's G sharp in the cello is picked up by the computer, and then it's making grand old synthesis of that G sharp for quite a long time, uh, like time span in the piece. And it's kind of walking away from that G sharp, but it's the, the um, the seed for that sound comes from that very pitch. Yeah. So I'm just going to play you what it sounds like. decided to give up on the score follower when the piece was done had been performed maybe at three four concerts like this working more or less all the time I decided I go to give up the score follower and I went back to the very simple solution of having a pedal for the cellists and by doing that the only reason why I did that because then I could spend those three hours rehearsal time actually rehearsing the music and not make the technology work and that's never a good situation so my second experience in, 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 with live electronics came, uh, well it was actually not the second, but this experience was a couple of years later and I wanted to have a quite different approach and the score following approach didn't really interest me as much anymore. This, it's kind of an interesting problem from a technology point of view, but maybe not from a, it didn't give anything useful to it. Actually there, there's an Italian composer Marco Strappo who told me something that I took to my heart that I thought was quite uh, well expressed. He said, never let a computer do what a human is better at. And that score following is not for the computer. That piece. The humans are much better, so then it's better to have a human to kind of control it. Uh, this piece I'm going to just briefly give you an idea about is for guitar and live electronics. And I still have the microphone on the guitar here, because I still detect what's going on on the guitar, but it's not for, to trigger things, events in the same way as the other piece. I'll talk, I'll show you in a second. Another uh, uh, reason for the microphone is I want to do effect processing, like the way Gordon expressed here. I take the sound, I tweak it somehow to change the, the timbre of it or something. 
And then I have seed selection. So instead of having score following, I divide my scores into 15 sections. And it's kind of an environment, so to speak. And I start somewhere, and then I step to the next environment, and then something is happening in the step to the next one. And within one of these scenes, the microphone might be active and detect what the guitar is doing. But the computer has no knowledge about the order of events. So whatever the computer is, whatever the guitarist is doing, it doesn't matter for the computer because there's not a predictable, it's not an expected order of events. So if he, he's doing something weird, the computer won't try to kind of figure out what he's doing. He's just reacting according to instructions. So the, it's a lot easier to make this piece work. Than the Types of detection. So I detect pitch because sometimes I double the melodies. So whatever melody will be people play, it will be doubled by the computer. Uh, some pitches might be expected, very uh, key pitches in the piece could trigger certain things. Amplitude detection, one thing with the guitar is that you play guitar, and of course it has character that has a loud attack and it dies out. So I, by uh, taking out for those attacks where I sometimes, sometimes let the computer play back the sound backwards. So he records the sound in a buffer, he hears when it starts, and when it's over, he kind of plays exactly the same thing back, backwards, to kind of back in time, so to speak, to make uh, impossible uh, envelopes. So Tabular detection, which is the more advanced thing, uh, I detect different uh, performance technique on the guitar. When he's playing with Asco the very sharp things, for example, um, the computer will figure it out and react in a certain way, and he's playing other performance technique, he will figure that out, uh, that out also and play in different ways. So, I'm going to, these are certain processing, I do the piece. There's some synthesis going on when I double melodies, I do a certain type of synthesis. And uh, this might be interesting, I record, for example, the first five, one minute of the piece, stored in the computer, and then I reuse it later in, the, in another section as to create variations on top of it. So the guitarist kind of plays with himself, he creates his own accompaniment in the beginning of the piece to perform on top of it. Later. Because that was one of the because for this piece in my kind of more my, my ideas of the composer was to work with variations. So for example, in the beginning of this piece here, what's going on here is recorded, and stored in the computer and it's played back here, it's performing on top of it to create a variation the same type of structure. So sorry for running through this, but I'm going to play a little bit. So I play in the beginning uh, of the piece. And this is uh, where the detection is very important. This is Vascoado, not much you know about guitar, but Vascoado is when you play it with the name, it's very rough, very uh, rough sound, very kind of sharp sound. So these are very rough, and just the timer may can kind of distort it, and there's some bar to physicality in there also. And every system is played individually. See, so the guitar starts playing this one, then it jumps to the wheel. These are the opposite. These are very soft, beautiful sounding chords going through the wheels, playing four seconds into four. When he hears a cue in from the computer, he will jump back here and play the next time. And when it's done, he's jumping to wherever he was before and continuing the wheel. And then he gets a cue from the computer, he jumps back here, playing this, jumps back to the wheel. So the computer is kind of controlling the four here. And the computer tries to follow what he's doing by figuring out what type of performance technique he's playing. So I'll play the beginning. which is, well, this, what you just heard being recorded, being played back, and the guitar is going to play this melody. This is what is already recorded in the computer. 
but I only record the computer part, I don't record the guitar. The guitar kind of feeds the computer with its sounds and creates the sounds of the computer, but I don't use the live sound anymore. So I just have the computer part of what you heard, but with the guitar playing on top. And the guitar is playing, it, 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 let's say this way, the computer is processing him like in a very classic way. This, it's the distorted guitar sound, but from an uh, from a acoustic guitar. And that distorted guitar is kind of breaking up and disappearing, and you will hear the guitar being doubled by synthesized sound, and that synthesized is kind of triggering the, the analyzing his pitches and playing it back at the same time as he's hearing it. And then he follows the same type of form, but now you don't have the wheel anymore, so to speak, because that's all it prepares. It's wheel now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Gordon.